I'm Gwendolyn Keist, and today I'll be reading from my novelette, The Invention of Ghosts. The rapping in the ceiling came to us in September. It was Saturday night and we were spinning hand-me-down records in our dorm room. Iggy Pop and Susie Sue and Donovan's season of The Witch, even though we both agreed that last one was a bit too on the nose. What kind of witch do you want to be, Everly? You asked me, giggling. Whatever which has the most power, I said, and tried to twitch my nose. We danced around the room together, all flailing arms and missteps, our weekend ritual of too loud music and cold pizza left out to congeal in cardboard. By then, we'd already been friends for years. I was sure of that much, though it was the only thing I knew. I couldn't remember the day we met. We must have been kids together once, you and me, strange and bullied and promising ourselves we'd get out of that small town hell. But when I closed my eyes, I didn't remember any of that. All I saw were shadows, where memory should be. Out in the hall, bodies moved back and forth, a holler here, a cat call there, nearly drowning out our songs. Every weekend, the other students went free range, wandering and carousing through the dorm, their sweat smelling like whiskey and hormones. A figure lingered right outside, wavering there like it was eager to come in. We held our breath. In the evening, we never opened the door. Not even if someone knocked. You and I were only safe together, away from the world. It's locked, right? You whispered. And I nodded. With a scowl, you shoved a chair under the doorknob, just to be sure. I wish everyone would leave us alone. Not everyone. I sprawled out on the floor, half dizzy from dancing. I wouldn't mind sharing our room with a ghost or two. You switched out the record, superstition for lust for life, and dropped the needle in the groove. And what about people who aren't like you? What if someone doesn't want a ghost to stick around? I laughed. I guess that's what exorcists are for. You didn't usually ask me about spirits, even though they were my favorite topic. I was a history major with a focus on the unknown. All those Victorian mystics and mesmerists and spiritualists who conjured Houdini and parlors. Yuri Geller with his spoons and Mother Shipton with her visions. I wanted it all. I wanted their secrets. You weren't so sure yourself. The way you keep diving into the dark, you'd say. Someday you might get lost there. I'd just shrug. There are worse places to go. You didn't know yet who you were going to be. The word undecided printed in bold, accusing letters at the top of your class schedule. Don't worry, I would tell you at night when you couldn't sleep. You'll figure it out. You'd turn to me, your eyes flashing in the dark. Promise? I promise. The speakers crackled. And still slouched on the floor, I spread out a row of vintage postcards I'd bought off eBay. Victorian figures posed in fancy parlors, their faces twisted, pale ectoplasm blossoming from their mouths, long strings of it stretching up into the air. You sat cross-legged next to me. Are any of these real? I shook my head. It was all just a hoax they used back in the 1800s to sell postcards. Yet even in the frauds there was something to learn, why people did it and why others believed. You put your hand over your own mouth, as if that might stifle ectoplasm from growing there. What's it made of? All different things, I said, gnawing my bottom lip. Heavy cream and cheesecloth, chewed up paper, whatever they could find that looked the eeriest. We huddled together, the contorted faces and the picture staring back at us. I moved closer, and something in the images shimmered. Just for a moment, just long enough for me to reach out, ready to awaken them, ready to draw out their magic. But you got to them first. One by one, right down the line, you turned over all the postcards. No more tonight, you said, shivering. I'd upset you. I was always upsetting you. I'm sorry, my stomach stitched into knots. It wasn't supposed to scare you. You waved me off with one hand. I'm fine, you said, and crossed to the dresser. As you changed into your flannel pajamas, your back to me, I quietly flipped over the last picture. The face there was sullen and still. No movement, nothing at all. The record ended, the turntable emitting blank static, and we climbed into our beds without speaking again. You were out in a minute, but I couldn't sleep, couldn't stop thinking about those pictures. Something was wrong with them. Or maybe something was wrong with me. That would explain it, why my entire life had escaped me. I'd misplaced who I was, easy as forgetting where I put my house keys. Across the room, you murmured in your sleep, and I wanted to ask you about it, about everything. Who we were, where we'd been. 
but it found me first. A single rapping right above us. Bodies still pushed back and forth in the hallway outside our door, but it couldn't be another party overhead. You and I lived on the top floor. Another knock in the ceiling and you bolted awake in your bed. What was that? Your face pale as the moon. Is something here with us? The room went silent again, but your fear was already rising around us, suffocating the air from our lungs, and I curled my body tighter in my bed, just desperate to keep you calm. I'm sure it's nothing, I said, and closed my eyes. But I couldn't stop thinking about the wrapping. Probably just a rat, I told myself, building a nest in the plaster. That made sense. It was also wrong, and I knew it. Plus, there were the postcards. Three or four times a day, I took out the stack from under my mattress, where I'd hidden the images away so they wouldn't bother you. But no matter how long I looked at them, the faces never moved again. Maybe I'd imagined all this. Maybe I'd envisioned ghosts where there were only shadows. I needed to find out for sure. You came home early from class and discovered me at my desk. I never heard the door open. Instead, there you were, suddenly looming over me, staring down at a black and white photograph of the Fox sisters. The founders of the spiritualist movement, I said, even though you didn't ask. They claimed they could communicate with ghosts. You touched their faces one by one. What happened to them? Nothing good. My fingers curled against the edge of the book. They did their performances all over, found success, even got married. Then it all fell apart. Why? You asked, your voice far away as if you were speaking from a dream. Because they turned on each other. Your gaze flicked up at me. They were sisters. It didn't matter, I said, and turned to the next page. Take a photograph with me, I said one morning just before Halloween. What will we wear? You asked, brightening, and I smiled. I'd enrolled in a photography class to learn about tintypes, the closest thing I could get to the old-time spirit photography. The theater department let me borrow two Victorian morning dresses for the afternoon, and in the basement of our dorm I'd set up a background with a red velvet curtain and two stools draped in lace, all for our own memento mori. Are we supposed to be like them? You asked when I showed you the pictures in my book, the ones with families flanking well-dressed relatives in caskets. Are we supposed to be dead? Only if you want us to be. I laughed, and you laughed too, though something in you shifted. Your mouth a rigid line, you stared off at the wall, scratching at your heavy lace collar. Ever since the rapping in the ceiling, you couldn't sleep. Sometimes I woke up at night and there you'd be in the next bed, your eyes colorless and distant, peering into the darkness above us. I'd always ask you what was wrong, but you never answered. I inhaled the basement mildew, regret seeping into me. If you'd rather not do the picture, it's fine, you said, and took a seat on the temporary set. I should have argued with you. I should have called the whole thing off, but you glanced at me again and smiled. Are we doing this or what? I set up the camera on a timer and joined you, both of us silent and waiting until the flash went off. There was another reason I wanted the portrait. At the start of the semester, I'd gone through all my dresser drawers in the desk and even my phone. There were no pictures anywhere, not of me or you or anyone else. My past wiped clean. Maybe it was a good thing. People talked about second chances, clean slates. Now I had mine, an opportunity to rebuild a life one image at a time. In the dark room that night, the photo came back different than I expected. Convinced I'd rigged the timer wrong, I'd moved toward the camera at the last moment, and my figure blurred out, a smear of shadows where my eyes and mouth should be. And there you were next to me, unmoving, your face wan, everything about you in startlingly sharp focus. Sometimes, though, if I stared at us long enough, we would switch. I'd become the one in focus, and you would blur out. I never showed you the picture. Instead, I shoved it to the back of my desk drawer and put thick folders and books on top of it. Anything to hide it away. Anything to keep you from being afraid. Thank you.